Today on this episode of the Post Christian Podcast, I'm excited to have with me Adam Nevins. How are you doing, Adam? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Eric. Yes. Well, I've been following your work with Serve Life for several years, and I wanted to get you on to talk about what you do, because I think there's a few shifts that your organization has made that if other Christ followers made and fought like this in their mission field, wherever it is, they would be much more effective. The two things, you guys fight poverty. You help people with their actual physical real needs. It gives you an opportunity to talk about faith and Jesus. Uh, and you also work really through local leaders. Talk a little bit about Serve Life, what you guys do, and how you do it. All right. Well, happy to do that. Um, let, let me back it up uh, big picture and just kind of look at our, our vision, our mission, uh, which is really all rooted in Ephesians 4. So um, let me read for you. This is uh, Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11. It says that he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers and, uh, and pastors, and his purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ. And so we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's son. God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. And, and that, that maturity, that is our desire for everyone in our organization. For me as the international uh, executive director, for our uh, staff overseas, for the children going to school in India and Nepal, we desire for all of us to grow up and become more mature, which means becoming more like Jesus. And so that is really the heartbeat of what we do. And uh, we believe that is best done by using both hands of the gospel. So preaching and sharing the word and the hope of Jesus Christ and showing the love of Jesus in very tangible ways. And so, you know, it, that comes through in really uh, three words that we use a lot are educate, equip, and empower. And so we want to uh, educate people to help them to grow and mature um, in every aspect of life, in, um, in their, uh, you know, education for their future vocation, um, in their understanding of Jesus and what it means to be in relationship with him. Uh, and so providing that education and then equipping them with the tools that they need to achieve that. And so, you know, if, they, if they're wanting to do a business and they need a startup loan to be able to do that, we want to help empower them to do that. If they need, uh, you know, some training to launch a church and, uh, and the necessary uh, materials to make that happen, we want to provide that. And so education, equipping, and then empowerment. So what does it mean to empower them where we're not creating dependency, right? And so we, we've seen a lot in uh, some previous decades of just the damage that aid can do. And so, you know, we see, you know, there's a tra travesty, a tragedy in the world. Um, you know, maybe there's a tsunami or something. We all swoop in. We want to help. But we end up providing uh, aid that creates dependency. And so we'll go to a country and we'll, we'll give them, you know, bottled water for years and years and years and years. And then they just end up with mountains of empty water bottles. Uh, we provide them with uh, rice so that they have enough food to eat. Uh, and then what we do is we subsidize American farming uh, for rice and then we send them rice and their, their rice farmers can never go back to work again. Uh, and so there's some of these things that happen sometimes in aid that create an unhealthy dependency. And so we wanna be sensitive to that and we want to empower them to be able to move forward on their own in the long term. And so the way that that comes to fruition for us is through three different programs that we're currently operating. One is to train pastors to plant churches in remote villages where there is no church. So we've got a, a pastor training center in Kathmandu, Nepal, and we train typically 12 to 14 pastors every single year. And then uh, we've added vocational training. And this is a new thing for us. We've only been doing it for five or six years now, but we've added vocational training to the pastor training. And then that way, when they go and they launch their church, they can also launch a side business that provides their daily income. And that way they don't have to look to the church to provide that income. Because what we've found is 
you know, a new church will be 20 to 30 people typically for about four or five years. And it's not until that fourth, fifth, sixth year that we start to see significant growth in the church where then it will grow to, you know, maybe a hundred people, 200, 300 people. Um, but prior to that, there's not enough people to even provide enough tithe for the pastor to do it full time. And so what we had been doing in the past was providing pastor salaries for eight years and, you know, four years at 100%, and then we'd slowly decrease over four years. Well, switching this model has made it a lot more nimble, uh, a lot more, you know, financially flexible, and it's a shorter time commitment as well. And so instead of, you know, an eight-year commitment where it would total about $16,000, we're making a one-year commitment to train, empower them, help them launch a business, and it's only $2,400 in one year. And that allows us to do even more uh, for people in these villages. So, so we've got this pastor training and we provide ongoing training for them. We just had a couple of weeks ago, our annual pastors conference, where we invite every pastor that we've ever trained to come back for three days of ongoing training and encouragement. And, uh, and that has been really helpful for a lot of the pastors because they're in such remote areas in such remote villages uh, where you know, they don't have a laptop, they don't have Wi-Fi, they might have a phone, but they might also have to like travel for a day to get high enough to where there's an actual signal to make a call from that phone. So we're talking really ends of the earth kind of stuff here. And so for them to be so isolated like that, where there aren't other Christian leaders around them, they, they can't really process the struggles that they're going through. And we, we do have regional coordinators that meet with them once a month that encourage them, and that's helpful. But they are very isolated at the same time. So once a year for them to come together, to hang out with their graduating class, to receive ongoing training. I, I've had a number of them come to me and say, you know what? I came to this burned out, tired, thinking about quitting the ministry, and I'm just rejuvenated now, and I am refreshed, and I'm ready to go back to the ministry. And so that's a, an important component to, to what we do with the pastors. So... That, that's one program that we do, training pastors to, to launch churches in remote villages where there is no church. Uh, and then we also uh, do microfinance in some of those villages. So we'll look at the villages where we've planted churches. Uh, and at this point, there are hundreds of those. And th most of them are in very remote villages where the average income is less than $2 a day. And we have an intake form for a village to figure out whether it meets the criteria for us of going into that village and doing the microfinance program. If it does, we'll do a, a one day presentation and see if it garners any interest uh, from people in the village. And if it does, we'll end up launching there. We'll appoint a, a group of local leaders that will oversee and operate the fund. Uh, we've got a 60 page guidelines document. So we train them with that document. And then uh, people will apply for the loans. It, it's normally, you know, two, $300 for them to buy goats or pigs or do a roadside stand um, or ginger farming, something along those lines. And we'll, we'll give them that loan and they'll normally pay it off in 12 to 18 months, depending on the size of that loan. We'll charge 5% interest, which is way different than, you know, the 30% interest that uh, predatory loans that are available to them will, will charge. And so that 5% interest, they actually get 1% of that back if they pay off the loan on time and they get 2% back if they pay it off early. In addition, as soon as they pay it off, somebody else in the village gets the next loan. And so they've got a cousin or an aunt or somebody that wants that next loan, creating some healthy peer pressure for them. And as a result, we have an incredibly high uh, payback rate on the loan system. And so we typically will have about uh, 100 loans active at one time in seven or eight different villages. So that's the microfinance piece that we do. Um, and it really gives a lot of credibility to the local pastor because while the local pastor isn't involved in the program, he doesn't oversee it, he doesn't manage it because we don't want a conflict of interest there. People that live in the village still know that the reason the program is there is because the local pastor brought it there. And as a result, we've seen a, a lot of those churches grow uh, from people that have gone through the microfinance program. So, so that's one program that we do. And then we also provide education for children. So we've got about 400 kids in India, in Nepal, that we're sending to school. Uh, these are mostly in, uh, again, remote villages um, where there's not a good solid public school system. Um, you know, 30 years ago, the public school system got shut down in Nepal. 
And so they're still in the process of trying to rebuild it and get it back up to par. In the meantime, a lot of NGOs and entrepreneurs have started private schools and those tend to be the better quality schools. Um, they call them English medium schools because they te teach English there, which then opens up a lot more opportunities for those children uh, to get jobs, you know, in the in tourism and hotels and hospitality industry and that sort of thing. So, so we provide education for those kids that go to school, and you know, we have a lot of uh, donor sponsors in the U.S. that are making that happen. Um, so that we can, you know, provide the tuition that they need, the school books, the backpacks, the uniforms, everything they need to be able to go to school. And so we'll partner very strategically with effective schools uh, that they're doing a good job and they're getting good results uh, in their education program. And we'll, we'll work with their principal and leadership staff to identify families in the community that haven't been able to afford to send their kids to school. And then we'll come alongside of them and partner together to send their kids to school. It's remarkable. I mean, the ways you're thinking through the entire kind of life cycle of a church, you know, and you think in terms mm -hmm. of Paul, which you have a lot of these Apostle Pauls going out, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. makers and they're going to places where people have never heard. And, and you basically are, as he would do, go in and kind of see who's open and bring healing and help. And the next thing you know, there's a church. When you have a reunion, like it sounds like you had recently, maybe even if it's an estimate, I know Serve Life has been going for a couple decades now. How many pastors do you think you've trained over the years? How many kids have been educated over the years? Do you have any sense of that? Yeah. Um, so in India, uh, we used to have a pastor training in India as well. And so we trained about 150 pastors in India. And then our current training in Nepal has been there for about 15 years. And uh, we've trained uh, about 160 pastors in Nepal. And many of those pastors are uh, very entrepreneurial. Uh, they, they have um, just the gift of church planting. And so while some pastors, you know, they may plant a church and then that is their church for the rest of their life. But a lot of these pastors will plant one church and then they'll travel around the local villages and uh, there will be a small group that will pop up here, a small group that will pop up here. It'll grow to the point where they start doing weekend church services and then he'll travel to another village. And so we've had some pastors that at one time they are overseeing five to ten different church communities. And um, and so what they do in that situation is they they raise up local leaders in those churches. And uh, we also have another training that we do normally early in the year in January, where it's a one month training for lay leaders, for volunteer leaders. And so th those pastors that are raising up leaders, they will send those leaders to our lay leader training. And uh, we call it how to help my pastor. Mm -hmm. So the idea is how do I come alongside the pastor to help shepherd the church, to help lead, to help uh, in any way that I can. And so we give them just some good basics uh, in that one month training. And then they go back. And what we find is a lot of times a year or two later, those same volunteer leaders will come back for the pastor training and they'll go through the full pastor training program. And then they will end up being that local pastor for that local community. And so when we have the, the church planters that are just always planting new churches and um, they just have that spiritual gifting, um, then they're always raising up more and more leaders. And, and so that has turned into the pipeline for us for where we get these new uh, church leaders that are coming in to do the pastor training and then uh, pastoring these churches. And we typically will have 50 to 100 applicants every single year, and we only choose 12 to 14 of them to actually go through the pastor training program. So uh, one of the benefits of that is we're really getting the best of the best that are going to be the most effective at pastoring a church in their local village. It's fantastic. And just to hear, you know, over the years, seeing it grow to have that much of a, a desire to be trained and have that many people to want to be trained is amazing. What I love about serve life, yeah. serve life.org it's S E R V L I F E.org in many ways, a church, in America that wants to have a presence overseas, in many ways, partnering with you gives them a chance to help make a difference in the lives of young people, 
who, some of whom grow up to become some of these church planters, I imagine, and helping plant mm -hmm. churches. You yeah. ended up in this role in kind of a remarkable way. This You weren't going to school to be a, become an international director of a, of a nonprofit. <laughs> Uh, talk about your journey towards what you're doing now. Sure. Um, so I, I was a communications major in college. I had a music minor. And my plan A was to be a rock star. So um, I, I'm a singer-songwriter, play guitar, and a few other instruments. And, uh, and so I, uh, as soon as I graduated college, I recorded an album in Nashville. I put together a band in Indianapolis where I live. And we started, you know, playing out, doing lots of gigs. Um, we had some moderate success. Uh, and so we, we played some big shows, you know, thousands of people. We got the opportunity to open for some very large acts uh, like John Mellencamp, Bowling for Soup, Avril Lavigne, Mandy Moore. Wow. Um, and yeah. And so it was like, we're almost famous, uh, but we just, we never, we talked to labels. We never got signed to a label. Um, and it's because like we were 80% awesome <laughs> and that's not enough awesome to get signed to a label and be famous. Well, and, uh, I'm what, sorry. What was the name of the band? The name of the band. Um, so technically we haven't broken up. We, we just kind of like, we haven't played together in about five years. Uh, and we put out an EP about five years ago, but the name of the ba band is Ashworth. And it's, uh, it's actually, I'm a huge Charlie Peacock fan. So Charlie Peacock discovered Switchfoot, produced their first three albums. He wrote a, so a lot of songs for Amy Grant back in the day. He's produced a lot of people. Uh, he's taught at Belmont University. He's written a bunch of books. And so I grew up, you know, listening to CCM music. And so I was big into Charlie Peacock, loved what he did. And Char Peacock is his stage name. His real last name is Ashworth. Oh, cool. And so I thought it would be ironic to take a discarded last name and it, for the sake of fame and try and make it famous. I love and it. wouldn't you know, I, I finally met him one day and I sheepishly told him the name of my band and he was like, okay, that's fine. You can keep it. <laughs> and, uh, but then his, his son, Sam Ashworth has ended up doing a lot in the industry now. And um, he's written uh, for the civil wars and a bunch of other bands and has done some movies. He's won some Grammys and stuff. Um, and so I've not met Sam Ashworth, uh, but yeah, so named the band Ashworth and, um, and really just had a blast and we, we played out a lot and we didn't really do like the youth group kind of thing. We really wanted to be, uh, out in the world and we wanted to be reaching people that wouldn't normally go into a church. And so we mostly played like bars and clubs and festivals and stuff. And, and, and as a result, got to build relationships with, you know, with bar, bar owners and, um, you know, the people that did the bookings for all the bands and that sort of thing and uh, built some good relationships with them and tried to give them a positive experience with Christians, you know, and uh, just praying that God would use that as planted seed in their life down the road. Um, and so our, our band technically hasn't broken up. Um, I think we, we're not going to try and get signed anymore, um, but we are actually this year talking about getting together and just recording a few songs for fun. Um, and I still love to play. I, I've actually, I led worship at three different churches over the last month, um, oh, just because I, I love to play and I love to lead worship and I love uh, music and I love singing into a microphone. There's just something about it. Um, and so with all of that, um, my wife and I, uh, we got pregnant with our first child. And at the same time, the worship pastor at our church resigned. And my wife was like, okay, we need health insurance and you need a solid steady job. So why don't you do that? And my dad's a pastor and I, I grew up a pastor's kid and I'm like, I'm never working at a church. Like there's too much drama and it's just crazy. And I don't think I want to do that. And so, you know, I swore I'd never work for a church, but wouldn't you know it, I ended up becoming a worship pastor. And at the time, you know, this is early two thousands and I really didn't like worship pastors. Um, they would do the whole breathy voice thing and they would always remind us what time it is this morning and you know this more this morning lord this morning lord we just want to worship you lord this morning and uh we just join together our voices lord this morning it's okay i know it's this morning um <laughs> and so there was just a lot of things i didn't like about worship leaders and so when i became a worship pastor i you know got up to the microphone and i was like let's stand and then i would just play the song 
And it took me a while to kind of grow into that role pastorally and uh, get to a place where I was comfortable with that. Um, But it really was a a fun job. It was a great staff, um, just a really incredible pastoral staff that I got to work with. And I'm still friends with all those guys today. And um, but it was really through that experience of being a worship leader that God put me on this path. And so what I mean by that is God took me to the minor prophets. He took me to Amos and Micah, where he's saying, I don't really care about your songs on Sunday morning if you are not living a life of justice on Monday morning. And for me, that was very convicting because I was not living a life of justice. I was living a life of comfort and ease. And so I decided, you know what, I, I got to get in the game. I got to get involved in God's kingdom come, you know, not just in my city, but around the world. And so I began to volunteer uh, with Serve Life International, uh, with International Justice Mission, with Love 146, uh, with a few other nonprofits, uh, helped start a few nonprofits in Indianapolis. Um, I actually got to play in the worship band at uh, International Justice Mission's Global Prayer Gathering event. Uh, with Lamont Hebert and uh, Ten Shekel Shirt, incredible guys, great band. Um, and I, I got them to come to Indianapolis uh, for a, an event that we were doing here for a nonprofit that a friend of mine started called Allies that that deals with human trafficking issues here in Indianapolis and in Indiana. Um, and so I just, I started volunteering and getting involved and helps, you know, I started my own nonprofit and I was reading books and I got mentors and I even applied at the School of Philanthropy here in town Um, and my mentors actually advised me not to go into it but to do more volunteer work and so that's what I ended up doing. Um, I did a few trips with Serve Life International to India and Nepal. I love the work that they do Um, and my wife and I actually also adopted our son from India and my college roommate was living in India as a missionary and so it just had a lot of pull in my heart to that part of the world and uh, and eventually, you, you know, I, I had um, I had coffee with the, the the board chair of Serve Life and I was preparing a benefit concert for Serve Life. And so I thought we were going to sit down and talk about this benefit concert that was coming up. And instead, he said, Adam, would you want to run this organization? And I said, well, well, of wow. course, yeah, I would love to. Um, but I don't know how to do that. And I don't know how to do fundraising. And, you know, I, I started my own nonprofit and I was raising 10 grand a year and Serve Life needs 10 grand a week. So I was oh. like, I, I don't know how to do that. And it, that felt very intimidating to me. And the organization was in a really tough spot financially at the time. Um, they had lost a, a lot of donors and um, and they actually were considering like just shutting it down. And so they were like, instead of shutting it down, what if you try, what if you helped us reboot it and move it into the future? And my wife and I prayed about it and just felt like God was saying yes Um, and just needed to step into that. So it was probably the riskiest thing that my wife and I have ever done. We didn't have any savings. um, And so we were stepping into a role where I was guaranteed two months salary and that was it because that's all the money they had in the bank. Wow. And uh, my very first donor meeting, um, it was a little uncomfortable because it was a gentleman that had just retired and he was one of the largest donors. um, And he had told the board, Hey, I love you guys, but I'm, I'm retiring. I'm starting a nonprofit overseas. And so I'm out. Um, Mm -hmm. But I will speak well of you. I'll refer people to you, um, but I'm done. So I met with him and just shared my vision for going forward. And, um, and that vision included a, a bit more focus. Some of that I've already shared with you at the beginning and just, kind of what what would it look like long term for the organization to continue to move forward and we got to the end of that breakfast and he looked at me and he said Adam I'm not sure how but I'm going to give the same amount this year that I gave last year you were better at fundraising and it was (laughs) no well it was a total God thing right and so it was God telling me Adam I got this this is my ministry it's not your ministry I'm going to do what needs to be done. I'm going to take care of it. And so, yes, I need to be faithful. I need to do a good job. I need to work hard. But this does not rest on my shoulders. This is not mine uh, to bear, to carry. And um, no matter how hard I work or how many hours, it it's not going to shift uh, the, the, the propulsion of this organization, right? So I need to do a good job. I need to show up. I need to work hard. 
I need to be strategic. But at the end of the day, I need to go home. I need to live a balanced life. I need to be a good dad, be a good husband and have fun. And, um, and I struggled honestly at, at, in the early years of doing that. Um, but really got to a breaking point at year seven. And I was like, okay, I mean, I either need to quit because this is so hard and so stressful, or I need to let go of the illusion of control and just do my part. And that's what I've ended up doing the last four years. And it's been liberating and much more enjoyable and much more sustainable. And so now 11 years into the job, I want to keep doing this. And I feel like I have the energy and sustainability, uh, measures in place so that I can do this a lot longer. Well, you're doing a great job. I can't believe it's already been 11 years and knowing the guy <laughs> yeah. there at the beginning and, and really kind of paved the way, you've taken it to a whole new level. Just really grateful for you, Adam. Mm -hmm. And thanks for that reminder. In our mission field, are we meeting the needs of those around us? Are we speaking out and bringing justice and righteousness, bringing more of heaven to earth. Thanks for what you do. Servelife.org. Check it out and be a part of it. Thank you so much, Adam. All right. Thank you, Eric.